Hello, everybody. I am going to take a seat here tonight, which only means one thing. I don't feel like standing. <laughs> it does not mean there is anything more significant or less about what we're going to be talking about here tonight. But um, I was really uh, so inspired in, in many ways. And, and really, last week, uh, my mom shared and really did such a great job talking about uh, the topic of judgment and how it affects us in our lives and and how really in so many ways unknowingly we enter into this place of agreement with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and in doing so we disconnect from the tree of life. In, In doing so we disconnect from the source of all that God has for us and it's so important that we would recognize any place where this is happening and that we would uh, really just allow the Holy Spirit to show us what it means to reconnect back with him as the ultimate source in every area. And as I was reading uh, my, you know, my devotional time this morning, I'm doing this Bible plan to read through the Bible in one year, and I've done it a couple times, and it's always exciting for me to, to go through a new Bible, and by the time I'm done with it, I've got every page, there's just something on it that, that has been highlighted that God has spoken to me. Um, but when you get to about three quarters of the way through, you end up in Chronicles in my topical Bible. And for the first nine chapters, it's a lot of like, this is genealogy and, you know, this person and that person. And, and I've come to find out that these genealogies and, you know, specifically in Chronicles, that there's a lot of significance to it. They're, they're pointing back to really looking at from Adam all the way through the Davidic line, through the tribe of Judah, and, and eventually ending up in the Savior that we know to be Jesus. Um, but the first couple of chapters are like, okay. Like, I hope there's something else in my reading today because I just read a bunch of names off a page. Um, But what I found out was that in the Jewish tradition, when you're reading the book of Chronicles, it's actually the last thing that you read. It was the last part of the story that would be told. It was a recap of all that Israel had been through, and it brings you to that conclusion, as we said, of the new temple, the new kingdom, and the Messiah that would come from the line of David. And so I did learn a little bit about Chronicles, and now you've learned a little bit about Chronicles as well, uh, if you hadn't already. But I got to chapter 9, and there was something that stood out to me, and I'm sure this has happened to you before you're reading through the Bible, and there's just a phrase that stands out to you. There's there's maybe in the translation that you're reading, you you see something that you hadn't seen before. And so this happened in both chapters 9 and chapters 10. And so I'm going to read 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 1, and uh, I'm going to have the first two scriptures, I think, available for you, but after that, you're going to need a Bible. So hopefully some of you brought your Bibles here tonight. Uh, Pastor Christian showed off that he brought his Bible, so, you know, good job setting the example. But uh, if you have a device, you're, you may want to, you know, switch around with us a little bit here. But 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 1. And this is just a a very short verse that speaks about Israel and some of the genealogies we're talking about. So all Israel was recorded in genealogies, and these are written in the book of the kings of Israel. And Judah was taken into exile in Babylon because of their breach of faith. So let's fast forward to the next chapter, 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verses 13 and 14. So Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord and that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek the guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. So the two phrases in both chapter 9 and chapter 10 that really stood out to me were these three words, breach of faith. We see that the nation of Israel had a breach of faith, and then we see the story of Saul, which we talked about last week as well, that there was a breach of faith, and that breach of faith was that he trusted in something else and did not turn to God. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Now, when I looked at the original, the the Hebrew for this word that we get breach of faith from, it's the word ma'al, and the definition of it is to be unfaithful 
or a treacherous act. And many times if you're reading through the Old Testament and there's this word in the Hebrew, it's going to be translated as unfaithful. That Israel was unfaithful. That there was something taking place where there was a covenant and that covenant had been broken. And when we build off of what we read last week, it's really important for us to see the connection between our faith and the covenant relationship that we have with God. Faith and the covenant relationship we have with God. Now, I don't know about you when I often think about faith. I don't think about covenant relationship. I think about faith as the courage to do something that I couldn't do on my own, the reliance on God to trust in Him and to take a step that, that really might seem uh, a little bit unsure or scary. But faith really has to be found in this connection to our covenant relationship with God if we're going to see it in its full context. I don't think many of us would look at a situation in our lives where we relied upon ourselves and think that we were being unfaithful to God. There aren't many times where we would say, okay, I need an answer for the situation I'm going through, and we, and we seek a different source, or maybe we pray first, but then we go do our own thing and think about it in terms of actually having infidelity with us and God. Let's just be honest. That's not where our mind goes to. We're not thinking about being unfaithful. We're not thinking about the covenant relationship. We wouldn't think about failing to seek God as the same level of cheating on him. It's just not that, that serious in our minds. But when we look at the way the Bible describes our relationship with God, there are multiple facets to it, obviously children of God. But many times, what are we called as the church? The bride of Christ. We are called the bride of Christ. And Jesus, many times in the Gospels, specifically in the book of Matthew, calls himself the bridegroom. Who knows that if God is giving us that representation of the bride, the groom, this relationship with God, that there is something of significance to it. And I would say tonight that it's not just that it's a representation of marriage, that that really marriage is meant to be based out of God's definition of marriage. So it's not just a, a representation of marriage to God. This is what marriage truly is at its, at its core, at its deepest foundation, because even when we leave this earth, whether we were married or not, we are going to find ourselves in a place of being the bride of Christ. That that's the eternal truth and revelation of it. And so there is great significance in understanding our position as the bride. So, if God views our relationship to Jesus as the bride, then obviously, as we just said, it's, it's pretty important. And so what I want to do is I want to look to start at the connection between faith and marriage. Specifically, when we're talking about marriage to God. And there's a verse that we camped out on uh, two Sundays ago, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And we were talking about the significance of our relationship with God, the way that we see him, the way that we perceive him. And we said that Hebrews 11, verse 6 says that, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. We have to believe that God is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. And when we went deeper into that, we saw that that word rewarder means that it's actually in God's nature and it's one of his values to bless those that he loves. It's not something that he does out of compulsion or obligation, but that he loves his children because that's who he is. So we have to understand that's the nature of God. So once again, faith, in this verse, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So in marriage, part of it is that there is a pleasure that comes from covenant relationship with one another. What is it that brings pleasure to God? All right. I was just waiting. just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page. What is it that brings pleasure to God? 
Okay, there's a few more that time. It's faith that pleases God. In our relationship with God, operating in faith brings pleasure to him. We have to understand that faith is not to be held as a separate value outside of relationship, that actually our relationship with God is, is really defined by the ability that we have to walk in faith, in our trust, in our relationship with him. So we have to, we have to relate, okay, God is is wanting us to see him as our groom. We we are married to him. We're in covenant relationship, not just an agreement, not just an idea of of dating, not, not any of that. No, covenant relationship where I give myself to you fully and that in that relationship, the way that I, I bring pleasure to the heart of God is by my trust in him. It's by my willingness that in my life and in my actions and to the core of who I am, that I am going to give him myself so fully that I'm going to trust, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's hard, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, right? Till his death makes that we never have to be apart, right? This, this, is, this is what it means to walk in a place of deep covenant relationship with God. I want to read from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. It says, The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. You see, that is the groom. That's the groom we're talking about. The one through whom all things have meaning, life, and their identity. That, that God has pleasure in what Jesus did to, to bring everything under the supremacy of Jesus. That's our groom. That is the one who we join together in our faith. That's the one when we understand in fullness what Jesus did on the cross that he was bringing us into a place of being able to be reunited with him in this covenant. That he gave everything. I guess you could say, and, and forgive me, I haven't thought this out, but like in some ways the, the proposal was his death on the cross. It was him coming down to us and saying, I want to be with you. Will you accept? That's pretty good. That wasn't in my notes. That's that one's, that one's free tonight. That's, uh, I like that. You see, we have to receive what he has given to us. And what I don't want to have happen as we're looking at this tonight is that we in any way step into a place of, of guilt or condemnation in the places that we haven't responded. But what I want to do is to really look at from God's perspective what this connection looks like. Uh, so that we have a greater value for it, a greater understanding of it, and that in our own lives, when we're looking at our relationship with him, when we're looking at situations, when we're looking at the things that we're going through, that we would recognize the covenant relationship we have with him and what that means for us. When we look through the Old Testament, we see many times that God, when he's speaking through his prophets, uh, he's speaking in a place of judgment. He's, he's speaking about what Israel has failed to do. And there's some, some connectivity, there's some continuity in some of the language that he uses. Um, but probably the most extreme of it is found in the book of Ezekiel. 23 times in the book of Ezekiel, are there any children in the room? Okay. 23 times in the book of Ezekiel, he goes so far as to say that the nation of Israel are whoring after their idols. 
This is very graphic language that he's using, but it's, it's obviously intentional. He says, the nation of Israel, it's not just that you have wandered off. We, we read many times that they, that they went to the high places, that they worshiped idols, they did all of these things. But he goes so far as to say 23 times that you have whored yourself into, for other idols and other nations and, and other gods, and, and you have given of yourself to such an extent that, that this is the language that's being used here. I read Ezekiel chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. And this, this is just, it's always the beautiful thing about God that he, even in the midst of the proclamation of judgment, he's still speaking to what he's going to do. And I say this a lot, but it's just because it, it means so much to me. But he says in chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, yet I will leave some of you alive. And some translations say, I will leave a remnant. When you have among the nations, some of you escape the sword, and when you are scattered throughout the countries, then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations where they are carried captive. How I have been broken over their whoring heart that has departed from me, and over their eyes that go whoring after their idols, and they will be loathsome in their own sight for the evils that they have committed for all their abominations." Yes, twice in this, in this passage, he's talking about the fact that they're whoring after uh, other, other things and, and other relationships, breaking their covenant relationship. But I don't know if, if you caught the part of this that really grabbed me when I read this. It says in verse 9 that those of you who escape will remember me and remember how I have been broken over their whoring heart. How I have been broken. Who's speaking these words? God Almighty. The creator of the heavens and the earth. The God who has no lack, no need, no, no deficit of any kind. And he's the one who's saying, I've been broken over your infidelity. For God to speak those words, it does a few things, but it really reveals the nature of God. That God would be broken over his children, choosing something else. This word in Hebrew means to be grieved, but, and, and this is how it's often translated, but the actual translation of this word is to break, to break in pieces. And some vessels actually translate it to shatter. God's saying this, and, and in some ways he's being vulnerable. Like this is, once again, this is God. Let's think about who's saying this. I've been broken over what you've gone after, over the places where you have not walked in covenant relationship, in the places where you have chosen to trust in other things and to such an extent that you have walked away from, from who I am and the love that I have for you. But I also think it's important for us to see in this that it is not just, it's not that he's saying, I'm broken over your sin, He's not saying I'm broken over your transgressions, over your failings, over the things that you've done wrong. He said, I I've been broken over the condition of your heart. What else does this say about God and the way that he looks at us? You know, we get so wrapped up in our actions and our failings in the places where... <laughs> where we just don't feel like we measure up. And it's not as much about that as it is about the condition of our heart. As a husband looks at his wife, and sees that she's been unfaithful, and, and more than the action 
it's that the heart, the connection has been broken. The word in this is, is the word zana, which also means to lust, to commit fornication, to be unfaithful. The thing that had broke God's heart was not anything about necessarily the outflow, but it was about the core. It wasn't the necessarily the effect, it was the cause. And when we look at our lives and we look at our relationship with him, what I would say tonight is so significant and so important is that we would take the time to not get so caught up in the places that we feel that we failed, but in the places that we have failed to trust in him. And because of that disconnection that we have then entered into the things that become so shameful. The enemy wants us to get caught up in the places of shame and condemnation. He wants us to get caught up and look at what you did and look at who you are and look at, look at the brokenness. But, but that's not what the Father heart of God is pointing back to. That's not what the, the groom is looking back to. He's saying, what is it that caused you to walk away from my love? Because it's that thing. It's the judgment that you have made that has led you away from that place of love and connection that, that needs to be addressed and dealt with. You know, I would imagine when Ezekiel is, is speaking this proclamation, this, this judgment against the people of Israel, that many of them probably would have said, well, that's not me. I did all the things I was supposed to do. I went to the temple. I offered my sacrifice. I, I, I maybe listened to the reading of the Torah. I didn't touch anything unclean. It, it wasn't me. What, what did I do? And I would imagine for some of us here today, if we would bring this into the context of, of our lives, we would think much the same. But, but God, I went to church, and I read the Bible last week, and, and, I, and I, did, I did the things that I was supposed to do. Like, I even like, let that person in front of me in traffic, and, and, and I didn't give them the finger. And like, like, it's not me that you're talking about here. But yet, in so many ways, we can, we can do the checklist and do the things that we know to do and have absolutely no connection or relationship to the Father. That the self-righteousness of, of, I did the thing, is very often easier than the, I'm going to put those things aside so that I can engage in relationship with the lover of my soul. There's, there's so much to this, but once again, it, it's not the actions alone that represented the unfaithfulness. It was the heart behind the actions. I would suggest tonight that the only reason that they followed after the idols in the first place is because they had lost sight of their first love that this was the breach of faith. It, it was not as much in the action, but on the reliance of something else and on something else besides God in the first place. And often it is the very same for us. It's the places where we trust more in our bank account than we do in his provision. And the judgment behind that in the first place the experiences that we've gone through in our lives that we have turned into a belief system as to why he won't instead of why he desires to as a perfect father. It's any place where we judge what we do not have and then decide because of what we do not have, we need to go to another source in order to get what we need. This was the visual last week. It was the two trees. It was the two trees in the, in the garden. There were more than two trees, but the two trees that, that God highlighted, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil comes about when we enter into judgment in a place of limited understanding 
And what we do is we choose to eat from the tree that feels like it's going to give us some control, that we're going to have a say in the matter, that's going to make it feel like we are doing something, and because of what we're doing, there, there's a feeling of security in it. And when we choose this limited source of information, we make a judgment, what we're always going to enter into is a different source than God. We're going to go to a different lover. We're going to go to a different provider because we're looking, we're looking for the thing that's going to fill what we feel like we haven't gotten. But what I felt so strongly last week and, and just really meditating on some of this this week is that that judgment, it really is such a temptation from the enemy. The enemy is so aware of what he can accomplish in us if he could just get us to take the bait. To just enter into the place of judgment like, like he did for Adam and Eve. You see the temptress in this, the other woman in this, right? It's, it, is, it can be represented by so many things, but I believe that the enemy is so aware of, of this principle that we are not aware of and so he will often use the situations to entice us to step into judgment because if God hasn't given it to us, then it opens up the door for us to be unfaithful and to find another partner, to find another source. But we often don't recognize it because when we step into these places of fear, of lack, of unforgiveness, and in the other place where we're turning to ourselves— we don't often realize that there's a seduction in the midst of it. We don't often understand that we enter into unforgiveness because on some level it feels good because we have control, because we can do something about it, because we can make sure the other person is going to pay for what they did. And we put ourselves on the throne and decide that we are going to be the judge and jury. We, we, we take God out of that place and we don't trust that he's able to use that situation for something greater. To trust that he can bring restoration and healing. And I hear about it too much and there's far too many people in the body of Christ that are walking in unforgiveness. There are far too many people in the body of Christ that have allowed themselves to walk in unforgiveness and to choose to say, I'm going to hold on to this thing because of what they did to allow relationship to be broken, to allow relationship with children and grandchildren and, and brothers and sisters and, and all of those things to, to allow that division to come in and to actually affect their relationship with God. But there's something about it that feels better. It's the same place when we choose to trust in money over God because it feels better to have the relative certainty of having what we need than the discomfort of having to trust in his provision. We lose sight of who he is as the groom. Not just Jehovah Jireh, as important as that truth is, not just the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, as significant as that is, but as the groom, right? When I do vows in a marriage, I make sure that they realize that, that what is once yours is now theirs, and, and what was once the, the other ones is now theirs. It's, uh, Jamie jokes sometimes, what's mine is yours, and what's yours is mine, and what mine is mine. Just joking, of course, but it, it, it's the understanding that what is mine is now yours, and when we're entering into covenant relationship with the perfect groom that is always faithful, He's the one that, that he wants to give what we need. And we're over here holding on to whatever money that's going to make us feel secure, when in comparison, what God has is so much more. I don't care if you have millions of dollars in the bank. That security is nothing compared to what, what the groom actually has in his bank account. But sometimes we'd rather hold on to the security of what we have. Like I've, I've done marriage counseling and it's like, no, I just need to keep this just in case. Right? That's what it is. I need to keep this just in case it doesn't work out. And I've always been like, mm, don't do it. You don't want to enter into, into marriage with the backup plan, with the safety net, with the plan B just in case. 
But isn't that what we do? In the places where we have to hold on to this thing because, well, if God doesn't, well, at least then. And I'm not saying anything bad about having a lot of money in your bank. I, I pray that you would be blessed in your finances, that you would operate in the fullness of what God has for you, that, that there would be an abundance in your life, but that your trust would always be in him above whatever that number is, no matter how many zeros there are. Zeros on the back end, right, Pastor Dave? We were talking about something the other day. He's like, yeah, the zeros on, on the back end of the bank account, not, not on the front end. Sometimes we put our value in the ability to do everything right, feeling like we can't come before God unless we have done more right than wrong because it's easier to exist in self-righteousness than to understand what true grace actually looks like. The grace that's not an excuse to sin, but it's the empowerment to no longer sin. But we hold on to, I, I did this many things right, and so now God's going to answer my prayers. It's not the kingdom. It's, it's not. Does God desire for us to walk in righteousness? Absolutely. But in the Bible I read, it says, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and that any of my righteousness doesn't come from my effort and my ability. It comes from who he is. We have to see the seduction in these things. We have to see what the enemy wants to do in this. And, and if we extend this out to, to a view of marriage, it becomes even more clear in a practical way. Like, if I ever found out that Jamie was going to, to find, she had a need in her life, like resources, and she needed money to buy groceries, and instead of coming to me, she went to another man, guess what? There's going to be some conversations that are going to be had with her and, and with the man, for sure. But imagine what that would do to me if, if she decided to go to somebody else. When there's this trust that's put in somebody else and something else, it's, it, it breaks the bond of, of the relationship. I have a funny story for you, just because I was thinking of it when I was preparing this. When I, I went to Africa last year uh, in November, and when I got home, I drove back from the airport, and I got home, and there's this guy in my living room, and I was like, hey, how are you? Who are you? And Jamie comes down, she's like, oh, this is, I won't say his name, he, and it's nobody from our church, so there's some good buddy I've never met. He's painting our living room. <laughs> and I was okay with it that time, because I didn't have to be the one painting, so it all, it all worked out great. But I was like, that's fun. Just walked in, and like, I don't know who this guy is, but, you know, just painting the walls, putting the molding. There's no deeper meaning to this. I just thought it was funny. <laughs> but if, if, if I'm not the one painting the walls, Jamie found somebody who would. But in that case, I was all right with it. There, there are certain expectations in relationship, especially in your marriage. There are certain things that should only come from your spouse. Painting is not one of them. But intimacy, of course. The highest level of trust. The highest priority of your time and your resources. The one who fills your emotional capacity for connection. These are things that are meant to be from your spouse. There's a higher value that you place on this with your spouse than anybody else. If, if it is to function in, in health, that's, that's what that's supposed to look like. But so often in our lives, and, and Jamie and I were having this conversation the other day, so many people, and, and my mom mentioned this in her message uh, last week, what's the number one cause for infidelity? I had a need, they didn't fill it, so I went someplace else. But the thing about our lives is that we don't ever get to use that excuse with God. God is never the one who is not giving us what we need. But sometimes, if we want to say it this way, the enemy tricks us into thinking that's the case. And so we look to God and say, well, you didn't give me the thing that I needed in the time that I needed it, in the time that I asked for it. And so, 
Well, of course I went to this other thing. And we don't necessarily have these conversations on, on this level, but subconsciously, we are. We're making this judgment of what we don't have. And, and so we look elsewhere. We, we break our faith. We, we have this, this, this breach of faith. We're unfaithful, and not because he isn't good enough, but because we have become distracted in our judgment about who he should be and what our lives look like in comparison to what I think it should look like. We've got to be aware of the places where we have allowed any lack or deficit to cause us to go to something or someone in order to fill what we feel like we don't have. Instead of going to the source, going to the the groom, going to the one who has all the answers, who wants to give it to us, and to recognize any of the belief systems. We keep going back to this. But the belief systems, the core beliefs, the places where we have put our trust in in an idea or an ideology that is contrary to who God really is. We look uh, last week, and I just I, we mentioned it in the, in the beginning of this in in First Chronicles, uh, the example of Saul. Samuel was dead, and Saul breached faith by not going to God. But this wasn't the first time Saul had done this. This was the the repetitive action in Saul's life, time and time again. I. He, he didn't have the faith and the security in God because of his own insecurities, because of his judgments, because of all of these things. And so time and time again, he relied on the flesh. He relied on others. And it says that he did not turn to God. And he so relied in man that he was trying to bring up Samuel from, from the dead to speak with him. There's another story that I want to look at quickly before we, we close tonight. Found in the, the book of Joshua. The people of Israel, led by Joshua, had just seen an incredible victory. They had gone into Jericho, the walled city, and they had seen God tear down the walls and that they went into this incredible fortified city and they had seen the victory. But what's the next battle that they go into? It's the battle of Ai. And they go into this place and there's so much, so many less people in AI that they're like, don't even send the full army. Send a portion. And they go and they get their butts kicked. And Joshua's like, God, why? You just gave us this great victory. And, and, and we're your representation. And what are people going to say about you? And, and what's going on here? We got defeated by this puny little city compared to Jericho. But we get to Joshua chapter 7, verses 1 through 15. It says, but the people of Israel broke faith. This is the same word. It's the breach of faith. It's being unfaithful. In regard to the devoted things, for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of a lot of other people in the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. And he said to them, go up and spy out the land. So they go up, they're attacked, they, they, they lose the battle. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan? And the Lord said to Joshua in verse 10, Get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned and transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. He tells them to get up again. Finally, he gives them the ability to find out what's really going on. They find this man, Achan. But just listen to the reason that Achan gives. Listen to his, his reasoning here. He says, It is true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold of weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and I took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. You see, he coveted what he did not have. He saw lack in the midst of the greatest victory that they had really seen. They were going into the land of promise, but he saw what he did not have. But once again, it wasn't the action of taking the robe and the money 
that resulted in God's anger. It was the broken faith. This is what it says. But the people of Israel broke faith. They broke faith. They, they stepped into a place of infidelity. It was the decision that I don't have what I need, so I'm turning to another lover. There's a lot to see in this story. I encourage you to, to go in and to, to read it even more. But it was the devoted things that, that they had held on to, and I do believe that there are specific things in all of our lives that we have held on to, and it wasn't that he, he wore it proudly. He hid it because he was ashamed of it. And what I want to ask is that we would allow the Holy Spirit to come and to speak into any places where we have, where we have allowed there to be hidden things that we've held on to for security, that we've gone into for a place of, of comfort, for a place of something that we feel like is lacking in our life, and that we would allow God to highlight it, to bring it to the surface so that in that area where we feel deficit and lack and neglect and anything that we don't have, that he can show himself as the perfect groom, the perfect husband, the provider, our lover, the one who desires to give us all that we need, all that we need to move forward into all that he has for us. But as long as we are holding on to these places of lack, to these judgments, the places we are connected to another source, we are not allowing what we need from our Father Father, to be present and to be evident in our lives. I want to ask if, if someone would just come up and just play softly here tonight. As we're doing this, I want to make the time for us just to, to allow God to speak. But I want to read also just two passages that talk about his faithfulness in the midst of our brokenness when we return to him. Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 18 through 22. Once again, this is Old Testament. This is before the cross. He, he's, he's speaking of what is to come. This is what the Lord says. I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tents and have compassion on his dwellings. The city will be re rebuilt on her ruins and the palace will stand in its proper place. From them will come songs of thanksgiving and the sound of rejoicing and I will add to their numbers and they will not be decreased. I will bring them honor and they will not be disdained. Those words, I will bring them honor. What is present when there is infidelity? What is present when there's brokenness? It's shame and it's condemnation. But he says that I will bring to them honor. I will bring to them the restoration. They will not be disdained. Their children will be as in the days of old and their community will be established before me. I will punish all who oppress them. Their leader will be one of their own. Their ruler will arise from among them. I will bring him near and he will come close to me. For who is he who will devote himself to be close to me, declares the Lord. So you will be my people and I will be your God. Our Father, the perfect groom in, in who Jesus is, wants to restore us. He wants to bring us back to a place of healing, no longer to operate in shame, to no longer allow the places of brokenness to dictate how we see him and what, he think he's, what we think he's going to do and what we think is possible in him and what we think we deserve. Think back to the, the book of Hosea where God uses the representation of marrying the harlot and, and all that he speaks to Israel through it. God is not looking to punish. He is looking to be reunited and to restore and to walk back in perfect relationship with the bride, with us, that we would be the ones who know who we are in this covenant relationship so that we could be restored, but also so that we can bring others into this place of restoration out of their brokenness, out of their shame. I want to suggest here tonight that we were in worship and I, I felt like I just heard the words vow renewal. That God wants to bring a renewal again of the vow and the covenant that we've made between us and him. And so let's just take these moments right now to just ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is, if there are any places in our lives that out of shame we have kept hidden, 
that maybe in our, in our shame we haven't even looked at them and we haven't even seen what they are, but places where we have entered into judgment, where we have, have walked in a breach of faith, where we have not seen you for who you really are and we've seen lack and we've seen deficit. And because of that, we have turned to something else. We've turned to someone else. We've turned to, to another thing to bring us comfort in the places where we feel like we don't have. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just reveal them to us here tonight. That you would highlight them here tonight. And that as we see them, that we would simply repent and say, Jesus, for any place that I have allowed anyone else to take your position, in any place that I have been unfaithful, not just because of actions, but because of the position of my heart. That, Lord Jesus, that you would bring the healing that I need. And that in this place of restoration, that I would see that I could trust in you with all that I am, with all that I have. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We just give you this time right now. a couple things here tonight that and you can continue just to stay in this place and just listening to what God wants to show you right now but I felt that there for some and it's not necessarily a blanket statement but the things that are being withheld in your relationship with God that there's actually a reflection that you might be able to see in your marriage your actual marriage and there's some places that There's a saying, the way that we do one thing is the way that we do everything. And and sometimes we see the manifestation of it in other areas, but we don't recognize that it's also in our relationship with God because it's not necessarily the other person. It's something in us that we feel like we're lacking. And so maybe just take that moment just to think about either in your marriage or in relationships with others, the places where you feel that there's been deficit. And ask the Holy Spirit, is there... Is there a place in me that has felt that deficit? And because of that, it's not just been in my relationship with you, but I've, I've seen it in other places. And the second thing is tonight that I really, I know this to be true, that in the areas that the Holy Spirit is highlighting, that these are the very places that God wants to completely turn around in your favor that in the places where there has been a a lack of trust in God and in your finances, that this is an area that God is wanting to speak into and to reveal certain things about, in the areas of of health, in the areas of places where you haven't felt like you've received what you need in relationships, in the places where you've had prayers that have gone uh, unanswered seemingly, that there are things in these areas that God wants to just completely flip. 
And that is the beauty of, of who he is. He doesn't hold us in these places. He doesn't keep us here. But when we see what's really going on and what's surrounding these things, it's then that he has the freedom. It's then that we connect back to the tree of life. It's then that we are now being resourced by heaven without the shame, the guilt, the condemnation, the self-sabotage that might go along with it if we didn't correct those things in the first place. I have said certain things more and more lately, but I, I'm going to continue to say them. Don't allow this to stay here tonight. Please don't go home and think, okay, I prayed for a couple minutes. I figured it all out. Everything's better now. Please take this, this time of reflection, of allowing the Holy Spirit to speak make some time in your life on a regular basis to do this to, to, to say Holy Spirit is there anything pay attention to, to the things that come to the surface pay attention to the emotions pay attention to the things that, that, that are the, the reflection of what's really going on inside of you and allow him to bring the correction tonight I want to ask if you would stand with me here I want to pray with you but I just want to, to connect to that, that word of that vow renewal. That in, in the place that maybe you saw here tonight that, that God was speaking to, um, in the places that he's going to continue to speak into, that we would just make this decision together as the bride to the perfect groom to recommit to renew the vow that we have made to our first love and to say, God, I'm choosing to trust you. I'm choosing to walk in the faith where I know who you are. I know that you are good. I know that you are perfect. I know the love that you have for me. I know that your nature is not to, to punish and to disconnect, but your nature is to restore me back to the place of the original design. And when I know that, when I see you for who you are, when I recognize that there is no lack in you, therefore there is no lack in my relationship with you, I choose to renew my trust with you, and I say all that I have is yours in good and seemingly bad, in the places of health and in the places where there is, there is sickness or anything in my physical body, that I'm choosing to trust in you and I give myself to you to have and to hold, to love, to be in relationship with, to be in connection with, to be in covenant relationship in a place of intimacy. I'm choosing again tonight to renew that vow to you. To say, Jesus, you are the love of my life. Take that position back. It's yours. And I just choose to remove anything else. Any judgment, any theology, any ideology, any hidden thing, any place of shame or brokenness or unforgiveness. I choose to come out of agreement with them. I have no room for any former lovers in my life. You're the one. You're the only one. And I give myself to you. In Jesus' name. If you agree with that tonight, just say amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, I just thank you that in closing tonight, that in any of the places where we have seen, where we have rejected, where we have repented, where we have re-engaged and recommitted ourselves to you in those places, to, to who you are, that you would speak into those very places and that you would turn around, that you would bring a reversal to the places where there has been brokenness, to the places where there has been deficit, the places where in our, our natural physical being we have seen that there has been something that has been lacking. And, and Lord Jesus, in those places where you want to just bring that reversal, I pray that you would do so tonight and you would do so, you would do so immediately, Lord God. That as the correction, that as the alignment takes place in us, that we would see the, the manifestation of it in our lives. 
and that as you give us freedom, that we would bring it to others. I pray that you would bless everybody here tonight in this room. Bless those watching online. Holy Spirit, continue to lead us. Continue to guide us. Continue to show yourself so good that you are the provider, that you are the healer, that you are the one that we need in every situation. And that we would not be satisfied with anything else, but that it would be in our relationship with you, that that would be our highest pursuit. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said, Amen. Can you just take just a moment just to quietly, wherever you are, just to thank Jesus? Thank His Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, just thank you. We thank you tonight. You're not finished. There's so much that you're doing in us. We just say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done for us. We love you, Lord Jesus. We honor you tonight. We worship you.